Okay, so welcome uh, to uh, the second lecture of digital design and computer architecture this semester. Uh, yesterday, we talked about uh, the introduction and basics. So hopefully, uh, you're motivated that there are a lot of interesting things going on right now in architecture, and there are more interesting things to come actually in the coming uh, few years, as well as a decade. Uh, and we're going to learn the basics to actually uh, how to enable those bigger things going into the future, hopefully. Okay, so today uh, I'm going to start uh, with some puzzles. Uh, it's going to be fun. It's actually more fun uh, when you have an in-person class, uh, but let's, let's try to do it over here. So uh, let me show you what the puzzles are. So I'll ask the question, what is this? Uh, some people may write in chat, although it takes longer. Uh, I assume many people who are in Zurich know what this is. Yeah, I think I see some people saying Stadlofen, yes. And they're correct. So this is Bahnhof Stadelhofen in Zurich. Uh, it's a very nice place, I think. Uh, it may be, look a little bit old underneath right now. Uh, and this is another view of it, the top view. You can see that there's some interesting construction that has happened over here. Uh, some people say a bit violent, maybe. OK. <laughs> so uh, the next question is, what do the following have in common uh, uh, with the Bahnhof Stadelhofen, basically? So this is. Guard Orient in Lisbon. Uh, it's a beautiful building. Uh, and I don't expect to see answers over here because I cannot really keep track of them, but feel free to. Yeah, somebody said the architect, and they're correct, basically. Uh, this is uh, Milwaukee Art Museum. Uh, it kind of looks like Bahnhof Stahlhofen, as you can see over here, right? Uh, the angles and what it resembles looks like what we saw uh, in Bahnhof Stahlhofen. This is Athens Olympic Stadium, uh, City of Arts and Sciences in Valencia. And this is probably someone paid more money for this, uh, uh, Florida Polytechnic University. And sometimes universities make the mistake of uh, showing off buildings as opposed to showing off their signs. As a result, you get things like this. <laughs> but it's, it's certainly good <laughs> to see it. But I, it's, it's better to invest that money into science and scientists in general, I would say. OK. Uh, and this is the Oculus in New York City. Uh, as you can see, which was supposed to be something like this, actually, but uh, the folks in New York City said, OK, we're not paying any more money for this. Uh, but basically, uh, all of this, what all of these have common is uh, really uh, the architect, uh, as uh, a couple of people suggested, I think. I couldn't see all the responses over here, but uh, this is the next question. What do all of these have common in, uh, with Von of Stahlhofen? And that's really the architect. And the architect is, uh, and ETH alumnus, he, he got a PhD in civil engineering a while back. Uh, and uh, basically, this is uh, what's written. Uh, the train station has several of the features that became signatures of his work. Straight lines and right angles are rare. Uh, and this is Santiago Calatrava, as what some of you mentioned. Uh, and I will say that your first computer architecture assignment is to go visit uh, the closed Calatrava building to this classroom except it's an online classroom. So you'll have, you have the option to actually go and visit whatever you find next to you. And if you're in New York, it's going to be something else probably than Bahn of Stadelhofen. And uh, for those who like a challenge, you can actually uh, find the furthest building that was designed by Kalatrava to uh, this classroom or to wherever you are. That should be this, by the way, not his. Uh, and I would encourage that you appreciate the beauty and out of the box and creative thinking uh, that went into the design of that building. Uh, think about the trade-offs in the design, uh, strengths, weaknesses, and goals of design, and derive principles on your own for good design and innovation. And in the end, uh, just like building architecture, the computer architecture is all about trade-offs in design, uh, getting some metrics to a level uh, that is satisfiable or uh, that, that satisfies the design goals. Uh, and uh, there might have been some design goals in these designs that we're, clearly we're not going to talk about. This is not a real architecture course. This is a computer architecture course. We will talk about the design goals in computer architecture later. But I want to motivate with this real life examples of real architecture that the real architecture actually has similarities to computer architecture because you also, you're also making trade-offs there. Uh, and again, uh, there's no due date for this. This is on your own uh, anytime during this course. I would suggest later during this course or later, even after this course is better, you can apply what you learned in this course and maybe think out of the box. Maybe you can improve the designs as well. And in fact, in the past, people have taken 
uh, my classes, they went and visited some of these places that were on the pictures, especially the Oculus tends to be popular in New York City, partly because New York City is probably a good tourist destination. But I received pictures of these people from the Oculus and they, uh, they in, in, in general, they agree that uh, it's, it's one of the best places to visit. But we'll have some story about that in a little bit in this lecture related to the design trade-offs. Okay, uh, but first, today's first assignment is something else, and we're going to do that together. Basically, we're, we're going to try to find the differences between this and that, where this is this. This is the Stadelhofen uh, station, as you can see, and that is this, essentially. This is some random train station. Somebody figured out that this is a train station in uh, Germany. Uh, I don't care, basically, but in the end, it's, it's, it's like a normal train station, right? It's, uh, it's nothing out of the ordinary. It's maybe kind of boring, uh, uh, but it works, I guess. It's not that bad, uh, but it's clearly uh, not, it doesn't have the artistic uh, value that this one has. And again, this, this could be uh, dependent on the person's aesthetics. Uh, uh, so some people may feel more comfortable in the other, this one than, than this one. So there are basically metrics. Uh, my point is you have metrics to evaluate these things with. Uh, and you can list these differences maybe after you complete the first assignment. So let's take a look basically. So uh, these are two different designs and designs can be evaluated based on some evaluation criteria. Uh, and evaluation criteria are essentially the metrics with which uh, you can evaluate different designs. And we're going to talk about a lot of uh, computer architecture, this digital design concepts, and you always have different trade, uh, different options for design, and those options lead to different trade-offs that lead to different uh, values in these metrics, and that's the whole point of uh, this uh, part of the lecture. Uh, let me put it that way. And let's take a look at some of the evaluation criteria. This is not, uh, this is certainly not uh, uh, exhaustive. But some of the uh, criteria could be functionality. Does it meet the specification? Somebody specified a train station to operate in some way. Does it meet that? Is it reliable? Uh, is it, does it occupy too much space or too little space? Area is usually uh, 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 related to cost, for example, or uh, uh, something else, right? Maybe you don't just you just don't have enough area, regardless of how much cost you pay. And as a result, you need to you need to uh, put this. Oculus in the middle of New York City uh, in, a, uh, in a very tight space requirement. Cost, uh, always a constraint in any design. Expandability, can you expand it? What is the comfort level of the users? And some of these metrics now start becoming, okay, it depends on the person, right? And we see that also uh, in computer architecture. Uh, you design a computer chip, uh, doesn't matter what kind, it could be general purpose, special purpose, et cetera. And uh, the metric could be performance on workloads. And the performance will be dependent on what workload is executing on the chip. Uh, for example, a GPU would be great at executing very parallel workloads that can be parallelized nicely, and, and also graphics workloads. But it may be terrible at executing very irregular workloads. So a comfort level is, in this case, the workload is uh, similar to users. And the comfort level is uh, the performance you get, right? Uh, or, or performance is uh, uh, similar to the comfort level you get. So I can basically. Uh, get, uh, draw a lot of parallels between real architecture and computing architecture because uh, real architecture also has workloads uh, that may be happy, that may be wanting some sort of performance. And workloads tend to be users for real architectures, but it's not limited to users also, right? It could be, I don't know, it could be animals also, right? It could be, depend it, it depends on basically who, whom you design it for. And in general, uh, uh, real architectures, just like computing architectures are designed for specific workloads, right? Uh, so uh, for example, uh, and they're sometimes specialized, right? If you go to uh, a school, you have classrooms in there and classrooms are specialized for students and teachers, right? They're not specialized for a random person uh, who may be uh, 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 doing, uh, I don't know, some sort of design inside uh, that classroom. So we don't know. So basically uh, there are a lot of parallels, just like building architecture, computer architecture is also very heterogeneous uh, as we will see. Okay, I don't want to go through all of these metrics. You can imagine many, many other metrics also like security or privacy, uh, aesthetics. Uh, so there may be many things over here. So uh, in the end, the takeaway is how to evaluate goodness of design is always a critical question whenever you're designing something. And this leads to performance in codes, evaluation and metrics. Performance uh, may be real performance in terms of end-to-end -end execution time of a program, which we will talk about, but it could, be, it could really also refer to any metric 
uh, that is related to quantifying the benefits uh, or downsides of uh, a particular design. Okay, so a key question also uh, related to this course. So we're gonna talk about metrics later in this course and we're gonna talk about trade-offs. Whenever we introduce an idea, for example, we're gonna talk about different trade-offs related to it. We may not, we will we'll try to cover the biggest trade-offs of course, but we may not be able to cover every single trade-off related to an idea. And whenever you employ the idea in a particular setting, the trade-offs may change also depending on uh, how the idea is exactly used. Uh, and we will talk about that when the time comes. So a key question, uh, also related to the subject matter of this course is how was Kalat Java able to design, uh, especially his key buildings, uh, like what we have seen the Oculus, for example. Clearly you can have many guesses over here. Now we're getting into the mindset of the architect. Like how does an architect work? And I think a computer architect is all similar to a building architect as well, because they do make a lot of trade-offs, both of them. Uh, and uh, they need to really understand what they're doing so that they can design uh, a building that require that meets the requirements, uh, the design goals, and also that makes workloads or users happy, right? And here are some uh, properties that I believe uh, are uh, apt to attribute to Kalat Java, uh, like very hard work, perseverance, dedication over decades, experience uh, that's built because of the first bullet over here, uh, creativity, out of the box thinking, a good understanding of past designs. Uh, we talked about. Uh, if you understand the past designs well, you can actually do better than the past designs. And I think uh, that's where education really helps when you, uh, that, that, that gives you the importance of the precedence, what comes before. Good judgment and intuition, that's usually very useful since uh, architecture and computer architecture are both some forms, of, uh, have, have, have an element of art in it, right? In the end, uh, you're kind of predicting the future uh, 20, 30 years down the road. And then strong skill com combination, of course, math, architecture, art, engineering. This is applied to uh, the real architect, of course. And you need to be able to have a good skill combination to enable this. And of course, there are some external factors uh, or external slash internal together factors. Funding helps. Usually, if you want to build something totally changing the paradigm, it takes a lot of money to actually enable it. Uh, like processing in memory, for example, we discussed this yesterday. It takes uh, a good chunk of money to change the paradigm of computation and you need some funding. Of course, that comes sometimes with luck. Uh, and if you have initiative and entrepreneurialism, that also helps, right? And I think two other very, very important things uh, that you can build in this course, well, in addition to the first several ones potentially, uh, is strong understanding of and commitment to fundamentals uh, and principle design. So I'm gonna focus a lot on uh, those two especially. Uh, but I think you will really be exposed to and hopefully develop and enhance uh, many of these skills in this course. I cannot promise funding, but hopefully you'll be able to uh, enhance uh, a lot of other things that are over here, especially if you approach this course the right way as a learning experience, as a formative experience, as we discussed last time, as opposed to just something uh, you need to pass by taking the exam, right? Uh, I think you would be doing yourself a disservice if you actually think about uh, just passing the exam, because there's a lot more to see over here, as you can see. And I think, uh, uh, and I think certainly uh, these skills can help you in other parts of life as well, not just in computer architecture, computer science, or computer engineering. Okay, so we're going to focus a lot on the principal design and strong understanding of and commitment to fundamentals and the rest of this particular lecture. Uh, but hopefully we will see other examples uh, like good judgment and intuition. We will talk about that when we talk about instructions that architecture design. Uh, and one of the examples I will give you right now is uh, usually it's better, uh, it's better judgment to design your instructions at architecture such that the specification is independent of the implementation underneath. If you tie the specification to the implementation, then you're really dictating some particular implementation. So you're reducing the freedom essentially uh, uh, from uh, how you can actually design uh, an underlying microarchitecture. So this is a good judgment, if you will, uh, on how to design an uh, instruction set architecture. Of course, we could argue that this could be a principal design as well, right? Uh, okay, uh, so what is principal design? Uh, in, in, uh, from the example I showed you from Kalatrava, this is Kalatrava's own words. To me, there are two overriding principles to be found in nature, which are most appropriate for building. Uh, one is optimal use of material. Uh, the other, the capacity of organisms to change shape, to grow, and to move. And uh, this is from him, as you can see, and that's how he describes his work. Other people also describe the work as Kaltrava's constructions are inspired by natural forms like plants, bird wings, and the human body. 
and I believe they're right. This is uh, the, uh, the guard oriented in Lisbon, as you can see, and you can see that it's based on some uh, humanoid blueprint over here. Uh, this is, I believe, his bl blueprint. And this is a special uh, form of architecture that's principled to zoomorphic architecture. Uh, as you can see, it's the practice of using animal forms as the inspirational basis and blueprint for architectural design. And you can read more about it. I'm not going to go into it. But similar to this sort of architectural principles, we're going to talk about uh, computer architectural principles in this course uh, that are uh, essentially very fundamental uh, and that, uh, that, are going, uh, that have lived uh, through decades and decades and that I believe are going to live through decades and decades going forward as well. Okay. So uh, basically, the next question is, what does this remind you of? I give you a lot of clues, I guess. Uh, this kind of looks like a bird. Uh, I didn't see anybody say it so far. Okay, somebody said bird, I see. Yes, this, this kind of looks like a bird, right? Uh, and uh, that was kind of the intent, uh, I think, uh, based on public documents by Cloud Java. Uh, yes, it's the New York World Trade Center, uh, but basically uh, the, the structure of this World Trade Center that was built relatively recently is bird. Uh, and it was costly. We will talk about that. So basically, the architect's answer is this. Uh, Oculus resembles a bird being released from a child's hand. The roof was originally designed to mechanically open to increase light and ventilation to the enclosed space. But because of cost reasons, that didn't come about. Uh, basically, this was praised. Clearly, there are strengths. So it, with every design, you have strengths and weaknesses. And this has strengths also. I'm not going to go through all the strengths, depending on the metrics, clearly. Uh, and you can see that uh, this strength came externally from some uh, person who was writing a newspaper article, a journalist, basically. And this journalist says, it is a pleasure to report for once that public officials are not overstating the case when they describe it as a design as breathtaking. <laughs> so basically, I, li I like how uh, he expresses it clearly because uh, usually uh, you don't get the <laughs> best uh, depiction of the truth uh, uh, from uh, potential authorities, right? But in this case, this is one opinion, as you can see, right? It's not uh, 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 the strength uh, is uh, uh, seen as breathtaking. But clearly, there's criticism also, as you can see. Uh, and, uh, and partly, criticism comes from the design constraints as well. Uh, so basically, you can see that Kartrao's original soaring spike design was scaled back because of security issues. So you can see security being a problem, even in real architecture, obviously. And in the name of security, Santiago Calatrava's bird has grown a beak. Its ribs have doubled and it's in number, and its wings have lost their interests of glass, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It may now evoke a slender stegosaurus more than it does a bird. So this is, uh, uh, I guess, a nice criticism, let's say. And this is, for your information, what a stegosaurus looks like, as opposed to a bird uh, that some of you mentioned was a bird. Uh, so basically, uh, no one is immune to these sort of design constraints. And these design constraints happen in computer architecture. Uh, it happens in uh, building architecture. It happens in all sorts of engineering, for sure. Whenever you're designing something, you run into design constraints. And it's really important to understand how you can uh, create your design within the constraints you're operating uh, at and how you can maximize the metrics you really care about within those constraints. So you can see, for example, uh, the design was further modified in 2008 to eliminate the opening and closing roof mechanism because of budget and space constraints. So security uh, made it of a different shape, uh, but budget and space got rid of the opening and closing of the roof that we saw in, the, in one of the universities earlier. Uh, and uh, in the end, even though uh, the budget was reduced, uh, the transportation has been dubbed, uh, hub has been dubbed the world's most expensive transportation hub for its massive cost of uh, for, for reconstruction, $3.74 billion. Of course, uh, uh, I don't know if this is true. Uh, I just uh, took this number from Wikipedia, which has references to articles. But uh, I can guess that it's true, right? The, the design, it, uh, uh, usually a very uh, out of the box design that changes the paradigm somehow uh, uh, is costly. And that's true, as I mentioned earlier in computing architecture as well. Uh, the design cost is always important. You cannot do everything at the expense of any cost. Uh, and even, even folks who may think that cost doesn't matter uh, will in the end be limited by cost. So there are certainly uh, governments who can put a lot of uh, funding to something, uh, maybe building a supercomputer, maybe doing even worse things. But basically, in the end, uh, they, may, uh, they run into the cost problem. And uh, if somebody tells you that high-performance supercomputers uh, do not have the cost problem, that's wrong. Basically, 
they are maybe less limited by cost, yes, because they're trying to optimize the maximum performance for a given workload and they have uh, less constra constraints about uh, uh, form factor. For example, this is a huge constraint about a form factor, right? If you don't see it, this is my cell phone. Huge constraint about a form factor. A supercomputer doesn't have that constraint. And as a result, its cost constraint is also much lower, but in the end, it's constrained by cost. And this is true, as you can see, for uh, the Oculus as well. Okay, so uh, that was uh, uh, hopefully an interesting uh, discussion related to uh, design trade-offs, metrics, and mindset. Let me give you another example of this. Uh, and this is uh, basically what I used to do when I used to, used to teach this class uh, at CMU, actually. And I used to use this beautiful picture. How many people know where, what, it, what this is? Any guesses? I don't see anyone. Uh, okay, maybe there's something, but I don't, uh, I'm not able to see it. But this is basically the falling water. Somebody said falling water. Okay, maybe they went there. Uh, that's good. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, constructed on top of um, a waterfall. And you can see that it's imitating the waterfall itself. There are two pieces of the waterfall here, and these cantilevers are imitating the two pieces of waterfall, etc. There are a lot of other things over here. Uh, basically, but another answer to this is it's really the masterpiece of another famous architect, and that's this architect over here, who's another principal designer, uh, and that is uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, basically. And you can see that this is one of the most important place to visit uh, before you die, according to some uh, people, let's say. Uh, of course, that's subjective in the end, but I visited this place many times, and uh, I would argue that it's quite good, actually. Uh, and we can play the game of find the differences between uh, this and that uh, over here. Uh, and this is this, uh, which is falling water, as I showed you. This is a more beautiful picture of falling water, I should say. Uh, and this is that. So clear the setting is kind of similar, uh, but there are a lot of differences. So this is uh, kind of a traditional design, let's say. And this is maybe more advanced design, let's say. I don't know. Uh, but basically, you can, again, evaluate these two designs based on many, many different metrics, which we're not going to do right now. You can do it on your own. In fact, I would encourage my students to go to Falling Water. It's only one, one hour, 15 minutes drive from Pittsburgh, uh, where I used to teach. And essentially, uh, whenever I went there, I learned a new thing, at least one new thing. Uh, and I think it's a good learning experience to really critically evaluate these designs whenever you go to, go to those places. They basically, uh, this architect did not design this one. Uh, it desi uh, they designed the previous one, and we will see why. But basically, the same questions apply to Frank Lloyd Wright. And I think these two architects have a lot in common in terms of uh, what they did uh, and how they enhanced the field and what kind of designs they produced. They basically were very principled designers, and they also had strong understanding and commitment to fundamentals based on their writing. You can see that. And clearly, they actually uh, did a lot of hard work. And they're their designs were always very costly, actually, uh, because they actually uh, challenged uh, things out of the box, let's say. So building this falling water is actually not easy. And in the end, uh, it was actually commissioned by the Kaufman family, who were the owners of uh, the Kaufman stores in the US, uh, which is actually a huge chain. So they were actually quite rich, let's say. And this family, in the end, had to say, uh, had to tell uh, Frank Lloyd Wright that uh, please stop, we're not paying you anymore. <laughs> Basically, uh, you can see that uh, these designs can get out of cost also. But that's true for computer designs also, actually. Uh, if you're designing a supercomputer, you're, you're again in the same situation. If you're designing a very cutting edge, high-end processor, you're in the same situation. Uh, somebody may tell you, okay, we're out of money. Uh, pick, pick whatever uh, you think is the best that's going into these products and convince that uh, that is going to be the best thing going into these products, essentially. Uh, uh, In-memory computation is another example. We will talk about, well, we talked about it yesterday. We won't talk about it a lot, but uh, doing computation in memory is changing the paradigm like this, as opposed to doing processor-centric design that looks like this, let's say. Uh, at least that's my analogy. But it comes at a cost, as you can see. So basically, hopefully, you will uh, be able to appreciate these sort of designs as well as you go through this course. And hopefully, you'll be able to uh, enhance uh, and develop many of these skills that are written over here. And if, if you can enhance your funding development skills, that's also good. Although I'm, I'm not going to explicitly teach you to that. But I think uh, in a principled way of thinking and principled way of evaluating ideas enables you to also potentially uh, a principled way of uh, re raising funding, let's say. OK, let me leave it at that. Uh, OK, let me uh, describe the principled design that this architect had in mind. This is uh, 
Frank Lloyd Wright. And Frank Lloyd Wright actually had a lot of opinions. He was a very hard-headed architect, if you will. Uh, but clearly, he uh, created a lot of great designs. And uh, he uh, said architecture should be based upon principle and not upon precedent. And this was one of his biggest opinions. One of, uh, and as a result, he did not design this thing that resembles everything else. Basically, precedent says, uh, 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 pre uh, precedent, sa uh, precedent means what comes before, right? What precedes. Principle means what is principled. You don't care about what precedes. You just design based on what is right. And uh, the architect did not design based on what precedes, which is there are a lot of houses like this in rural uh, America uh, that looks like this. They're beautiful, I think. I don't mind living in them, but I would pr probably prefer uh, living in something like this, right? It's, uh, it's much more eye-opening, let's say, uh, and uh, mind-stretching also. Uh, so this is more designed uh, based on principle. And this is the pr design principle, organic architecture. It's a philosophy of architecture, which promotes harmony between human habitation and the natural world through design approaches so sympathetic and well-integrated with its site that buildings, furnishings, and surroundings become part of a unified interrelated composition. This is a nice piece of writing, by the way. OK, I'm not going to talk about this more, but basically, I already said that this is well integrated with the nature, with the waterfall uh, on top of which it is built. OK, so basically, uh, we're going to talk a lot about principle design and strong understanding and commitment to fundamentals. Let me finish with some takeaways over here, uh, at least this part of the lecture one, uh, lecture 2A. So in the end, uh, computing architecture, just like building architecture, all starts from the basic building blocks and design principles. And that's why you're taking this course, hopefully, because it's a freshman course, right? And of course, you just don't learn just the principles, but you also learn the knowledge of how to use and apply them initially. And as you go through that, you will also figure out how to enhance them uh, and adapt them uh, to the conditions uh, that you're dealing with. So this is very important. And that's one of the reasons why we have the labs. That's one of the reasons why we have the readings uh, that, are, that are going to kind of push you to be critical. And in the end, it's important to keep in mind that underlying technology might change. Uh, this is true for, again, computing architecture as well as building architecture. In building architecture, for example, you may have steel versus wood. Uh, or, uh, but in uh, computing architecture, you may have, I don't know, mechanical systems versus electrical systems versus quantum systems later on. Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe phase change-based systems, et cetera. But methods of taking advantage of technology bear resemblance. So you may still uh, take advantage of, for example, caching, locality, which are principles that we will discuss, pipelining, uh, to take advantage of the underlying material and technology, uh, regardless of what the technology looks like. But of course, as you design the architecture and the algorithms together with the technology, you can do better, but some principles will remain for sure. And methods used for design depend on the principles employed as well. And we're going to talk about that uh, quite a bit in this uh, lecture. OK, so basically, this is an example of how the same uh, 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 takeaways over here apply to processor chips. So basically, there are basic building blocks in, in a processor chip, and there are design principles. Uh, this end is duplicated somehow. I'm going to fix these slides. Uh, somehow, it's duplicated in all of the slides. You can see that there's a copy-paste error over here. But basically. Uh, if you, even though you may have different platforms, uh, there are basic building blocks there and design principles remain similar. Data centers, uh, drones, uh, self-driving cars, uh, and uh, high-performance supercomputers, uh, TPUs. For example, you can have a systolic array doing matrix multiplication over here. You can have a systolic array doing matrix multiplication in the high-performance computing engine or a CPU, right? Uh, and also a different platform. So they, uh, these platforms are based, uh, all based on some design principles and basic building blocks. That's true for processing in memory engines also, as we discussed yesterday. For example, this FIMDRAM that was introduced by Samsung uh, last year was essentially using an instruction set that is reasonably similar to any other instruction set that you would see uh, in the processor that you're going to design actually for uh, your labs, for example. Uh, it's a subset of the instruction set, in fact. So there are some basics that all remain similar. But of course, how you use those principles in the particular uh, system uh, that you're trying to design with the design constraints and the design metrics you're trying to achieve uh, is uh, what makes you a real architect. Of course, you need to learn the principles, but you also need to learn how you apply them. So let me give you some of the basic building blocks. These are things that we're going to see uh, in, the, uh, in this class, basically. Uh, there are electrons, transistors, logic gates, combination logic circuits, sequential logic circuits, 
storage elements and memory. And then on top of that, these are basically relatively simple building blocks. You, you're, we're going to start with a transistor, for example, as uh, a building block, uh, as an abstraction level. And then we're going to build logic gates and then logic circuits. And then on top of that, we're going to build uh, like cores, caches, interconnect, and memories. And also, we're going to look at design principles on how to operate, how to design these things internally. So there's a lot we will learn, basically, in this course. We're going to go all the way from electrons. We're not going to talk about physics clearly, because that's outside the scope of this course. Hopefully, you all uh, know the basics of physics in your, from your high school. Uh, but we're going to start with the abstraction level of a transistor. OK, so basically, let me jump into the course logistics uh, for the rest of lecture 1A uh, or 2A over here. But we have some reading assignments for this week. I mean, this week means you can start right now. And we're going to cover some of these things uh, next week, actually. Uh, chapter 1 in Harris and Harris, I would suggest uh, reading chapters 1 and 2 in Pat and Patel. And again, as I mentioned yesterday, nothing is really required. You can get a lot of uh, 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 things in the lecture, uh, from the lectures. But I would recommend that you do the readings so that you can enhance your understanding. And there are always some things in the readings that I don't cover. It's because it's not possible to cover uh, everything in the readings. And clearly, there are a lot. Uh, uh, clearly, there are a lot that's in the lectures that the buildings don't uh, that the, that the readings don't cover, right? Uh, so I would. Uh, it depends. Basically, somebody's asking, would you recommend reading both books or one of them? I mean, it really depends on your bandwidth. Uh, usually, I will uh, prioritize. Uh, so I will say chapter uh, one is more important. We'll cover similar to either Pat and Patel or Harris and Harris. Uh, I would recommend getting both books if if it's possible. Uh, uh, if not, we're going to cover a lot of Harris and Harris, uh, and less so Pat and Patel. But Pat and Patel have a different approach than Harris and Harris. It doesn't cover digital design, for example. That's one downside with Pat and Patel. It doesn't cover dis digital design as much, I should say. So Harris and Harris uh, will be more useful, potentially, for the labs as well, uh, because of the very long. So if you have to choose one, then pick Harris and Harris. But uh, if you are able to, pick, get both, because both have different sorts of insights, for sure. Uh, that's why I have both books. And in the end, as I said yesterday, this, this lecture uh, really is not in any of the books outside. As you will see in the second half of the course, uh, these, uh, these books will not cover anything uh, that we cover in the second half of the course. And we will not cover some things in these books also. Uh, OK, so basically, let me tell you about the major goals of this course. Uh, I mean, I, give you, I gave you some examples, but uh, basically, we're going to cover in digital design and computer architecture. We would like to understand the basics understand the principles of design, and understand the precedents, basically what came before. Because I think it's really important to understand what came before and understand the lessons uh, that we have, driven, uh, we, we have uh, uh, drawn from it so that we can actually do better in the future. Right? And based on such understanding, we'll do a lot of things. First of all, we'll learn how a modern computer works underneath. We will evaluate trade-offs of different designs and ideas. And hopefully, this will be exciting. Because I think the methodology we will apply uh, implicitly or explicitly to these will be important for anything you do. In the end, the world is uh, really about designs and ideas. And uh, whatever you do in the future, you will be exposed to designs and ideas. And a methodical way of evaluating designs and ideas is going to be important. Uh, and then uh, we're, we're going to implement a principal design, a simple, very simple, unfortunately, microprocessor, because we don't have time in this course. If you had to uh, implement uh, a not so simple microprocessor, it'll take you a lot of time. Uh, and then we will learn to systematically debug increasingly complex systems. And this is going to happen in the labs, for sure. Uh, you will have bugs. You will have issues with the platform. You will figure out how to solve them. Uh, whatever bug you're having, uh, it, uh, it's, it's important to uh, keep in mind that uh, whenever people design much more complicated processors and systems, uh, they go through the pains of uh, going through a bug for uh, 10x or sometimes 100x the amount of time you put into it, <laughs> which is interesting. So uh, let me give you an anecdote over here. Uh, I was at, uh, once at a conference. Uh, this is the DSN, Dependable Systems and Networks Conference in 2014. And there was a Google engineer uh, who was giving a keynote speech. And this Google engineer said, uh, we designed this beautiful software system. And then uh, there was a bug one day. Uh, and we didn't understand what it was. So we chased this bug for eight months, maybe 10 months. And then in the end, it turned out to be a bit flip in memory. So uh, that's why he was invited to give this talk at the Dependable Systems Conference. And basically, uh, sometimes the bugs may come from actual bit flips in memory. 
And there's a beautiful uh, description of that lecture if you can find it online. Okay, so and hopefully the goal, the bigger goal is to enable you to essentially be critical thinkers and develop new out of the box designs. Of course, right immediately at the end of this lecture, you may not be able to do that, but I think uh, that's uh, as, a, as a teacher and educator, that's my goal uh, with every, every time I teach a class uh, or mentor students. The goal really should uh, be to enable you to be independent thinkers and independent developers uh, who, can, uh, who can make all of these design decisions and trade-offs to enable new things, essentially. That's how progress happens, right? If you're limited to what happened from the past, then progress doesn't happen. Progress only happens with new ideas, new designs, uh, and new creations in the end. And then, okay, the focus, as I mentioned earlier, is in, on basics, principles, and precedents, and how to use them to create, implement good designs. Okay, why, are the, uh, why do we use these goals? Clearly, one of the reasons is because you're here for a computer science or engineering degree, depending on where you're coming from. But I think more than that, regardless of your future directions, learning the principles of digital design and computer architecture, I believe, will be useful to do many things. So clearly, uh, within the domain of computing, you can design better hardware. You can design better software because you know on, on, well, how the underlying hardware operates. You can design better systems by taking advantage of both hardware and software together. You can make better trade-offs in design in general, not just in computing. Understand why computers behave the way they do. And overall, more broadly, you can solve problems better. You can think in parallel. In fact, hardware is inherently parallel. You will, you will figure that out in, in, in the rare log assignments you will do. It's very different from the programs you have written uh, in the past, unless you've done parallel programming. But uh, 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 for example, if you're programmed in C, Java, or Python, these are uh, not parallel languages by nature, right? Uh, you have to do special things to make them parallel. And even then, they're not that parallel. Whereas Verilog is inherently parallel. Signals are, signals are generated concurrently. And you need to manage that concurrency if you really want to uh, design hardware. So that's why designing hardware is actually a very good way of thinking in parallel. And I think think critically, as I mentioned, that's going to be a very important goal of this course. And hopefully that'll be useful for many, many purposes. Okay, let me quickly go over some course info and logistics. I've already covered who I am. Uh, if, you, if you missed the last lecture, you can uh, look at that last lecture uh, to figure out who I am. Uh, but you can reach me uh, here. Again, as I said earlier, uh, my email tends to be not so reliable. I get too much email, well, uh, unfortunately, uh, and I cannot prevent it. Uh, uh, and as a result, if you don't get an answer, don't take it as a no or don't take it as a, uh, uh, as a reason that I'm ignoring you. Uh, either resend it or, more, or better yet, I think uh, it's better to CC uh, some of the TAs also uh, in, the, uh, in the question so that they can remind me if it's something that I have to respond to. Uh, okay, uh, I'm not going to talk about more of this, but I will introduce... Uh, uh, lecturers and PhD assistant. The head assistant is Juan. Uh, maybe Juan can say hi quickly. Hello, everyone. Okay, that's Juan. Uh, okay, yeah, you can see him also. That's good. And uh, why said is Hassan. Maybe Hassan can also say hi. Hassan is especially responsible for the labs. Hello. Okay, you can also see him. There you go. Uh, we also have uh, Frank as a lecturer. Uh, we'll see how many times he lectures this time. Usually in the past, uh, whenever I was out of town, he used to lecture. Uh, I guess the option of going out of town is not that much these days. So uh, we'll see how we schedule with him. And then we also have other key assistants and guest lecturers. I'm, going, I'm just going to leave this uh, over here so that you can uh, see the names, but it'll take too much time to introduce everyone. But Jisun, Mohammed, Lois, and Minesh are essentially uh, key assistants uh, and maybe sometimes guest lecturers also. Uh, okay, there are also a bigger team of PhD assistants who are listed over here. I'm not going to uh, mention their names, but you will get to meet them uh, uh, in office hours, in lab sessions, etc. And also we have student assistants who will be especially helpful in the lab sessions. Many of these student assistants are actually uh, folks who have taken the courses in previous years uh, and uh, done well, excited about the topic. So they're actually going to help you with the labs. Uh, some of them are not. Some of them actually uh, are uh, my master's students who know this topic really well also. So it's a good mixture over here. Some of them actually uh, have been student assistants multiple years in a row, uh, three or four years almost. Well, I don't know about four years, but three years, I believe. Okay, so there are some labs that are going to happen. You, you know the times. You can find them online, and we're going to assign lab assistants to these sessions. 
you will be able to find them. If you need help, please post uh, to Piazza. Uh, uh, and these are, uh, Piazza is the major mode of communication for preferred uh, or technical uh, questions. Uh, and uh, you can also write an email to this digital technique list. Uh, this goes to the instructor and all assistants. But I think technical questions are better handled in Piazza because you can also get an answer from some of your fellow students. And in the past, we've had nice discussions on Piazza between students. And I think I'm a, uh, that, uh, I, I would prefer that because that, that enables you to uh, learn more. That enables everyone in the class to learn more as opposed to uh, you trying to get an answer uh, from uh, TAs. Uh, and I think in the end, we vet the question. So if there's a good answer from some other student, uh, we actually say, uh, mm, uh, uh, this is a good answer. <laughs> and sometimes we actually correct the answers or uh, put, give our own answers. So basically, uh, Piazza is preferred, let's say, unless you have some uh, uh, like uh, logistics issues uh, related to your own registration in the course, then you should definitely email uh, as opposed to writing it on Piazza. I don't know if Piazza provides a method for that. Uh, if it does, then uh, feel free to do it over there also. Uh, okay. So come to office hours uh, uh, whenever you have questions and we will provide Zoom links. So check the website for that. And this, this is the website. This is where you can get up-to-date course info. You can basically find everything related to the course over here. This is your single point of access. I would recommend frequently checking it. We, for example, have the YouTube live stream links updated. We, we put the lecture notes earlier, as early as possible, usually the previous night, but sometimes immediately before the lecture, uh, depending on how overloaded we are. Uh, so basically, I would recommend using the website as a great resource. And sometimes you will get emails. Uh, I think you may have gotten some of them. Uh, so please check your email. And also, lecturers and teaching assistants will be people who you can get up-to-date info. So let me talk about some policies in terms of lectures. So lectures are, as you know, Thursdays, Fridays. So I mentioned that I will start a little bit early. I think it's better to start a little bit early and give you a longer break. So in the future, I will prefer to start about 14.05, between 14.05 and 14.10, let's say. I think that gives you enough time before the previous lecture. Uh, and these are all recorded anyway. So you can, you can start live streaming later if you want to do it over YouTube. If you want to ask questions, I think Zoom is a better place, but YouTube is also fine. Uh, so it, it really depends on you. Uh, and attendance, again, I'm not requiring attendance uh, from anyone uh, like any of my courses. Uh, I'm a big believer in students uh, learning as opposed to uh, being required to do things. Uh, so I think, uh, Attendance, take it as something for your benefit. Uh, if you are benefit from the live lectures and if you can ask questions, if you like the environment better that way, then attend it. Uh, uh, I believe it's important, uh, but again, I'm not going to require it. Uh, if you don't think uh, you're losing much uh, from attending live, then uh, watch the lectures at your convenience. That's perfectly fine, right? And some days we may have guest lectures and exercise sessions. Next, next week, for example, we will talk about uh, the labs uh, so I believe Hassan will give a lecture uh, on how we will handle the labs. Okay, that brings me to labs over here. Uh, next, uh, uh, see online, uh, but you should definitely attend the lab sessions. These are mandatory because uh, your, your progress in the labs really depends on the, your attendance, whereas that's not true for the lectures, for example. Mm. But of course, I wouldn't recommend uh, delaying the attendance in all lectures to the end of the class. That's not a good uh, way of making progress, right? It's good, it's good to pace yourself in a reasonable pace that you're comfortable with. But I don't think that pace should be, okay, I'm gonna watch 25 lectures right before the exam. That's not going to work. And that's not a good mindset, I think. Okay, uh, so you should definitely attend the lab sessions. Labs are actually about 30% of the grade. You can find the grading online. I think it was 30%. It used to be 25%. We increased it to 30%, which is the highest allowable uh, by ETH. If it were up to me, I would actually increase it further because I think this hands-on experience plus homeworks are really important in your development, much more so than exams, in my opinion, but uh, we are limited by uh, the regulations over here. And uh, unfortunately, that's, that tends to be above my pay grade to change the regulations uh, at this point. Uh, so basically, we, you, you're getting the maximum possible grade from the hands-on assignments. Uh, uh, and uh, that's, that's essentially the reason why homeworks are also optional. Uh, we made them optional because we cannot make, we cannot assign grades to them. But I think uh, we will talk about homeworks in a little bit. But uh, as, as I said over here, labs will start March 9th. Uh, and uh, you can find the handouts, et cetera, on the website. 
Okay, lab organization. I think you've gotten some emails related to this. You should definitely uh, attend to them. These are key things. Choose your preferred group. As I mentioned yesterday, try to uh, uh, find a partner whom you know and whom you can work with. That's important. Uh, and uh, I think some of you already mentioned that you're going to use your lab grades from previous years. And those of you who are going to use your lab grades, thank you. And I think that's going to be good for you because you're just going to get the same grade uh, which is probably perfect, uh, given that you, have uh, or close to perfect, let's say, given that you've opted to do so. Okay, so let's talk about final exam. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of emphasis on the final exam since it has to be uh, at, at least 70% of the grade. Uh, it's a three hour of it's an exam and you can find examination rules in the course catalog. And also we, all, we have all the previous exams uh, on uh, our course website. Uh, exam questions, are going to be sometimes similar to questions in optional homeworks and past exams, but that's not necessary. Uh, so optional homeworks are actually optional, but they're highly recommended, essentially. Uh, and I, I also say solving past exams could be helpful. And we're going to talk more about this toward the end of this course. We're going to have actually have some discussion sessions that we're going to release where we go through uh, the solutions to some questions. So again, I will, uh, I mean, certainly uh, it will be important that you do well in the exam, but I would recommend that you don't uh, worry about it too much and take this course as a learning experience uh, uh, overall, uh, because I think what you're going to learn uh, will be much more important. And again, in general, uh, personally, I think that uh, a single exam uh, that's done at the end is not a great way of evaluating uh, the learning and the potential of people, uh, but that's what the regulations dictate uh, today. Uh, uh, if it were up to me, I would do something else, but that's uh, we're, we're bound by that, and you're bound, bound by that. Uh, basically, let me say that we're all in the same boat uh, at this point. But I think we're going to help you as much as possible so that you can pre prepare for the exam, uh, so you're going to see a lot of sessions. And if you really understand the material, I think by nature you're going to do uh, reasonably well on the exam. Uh, but again, uh, that depends on how well of a test taker you are also, right? Some people just don't, don't happen to do well on the exams. And we know all of that uh, as uh, lecturers. OK, so these are some reading assignments for this week. As I mentioned, please do the reading assignments. You can start doing them. And we also have a supplementary lecture slides uh, on binary numbers. Uh, I, I hope this is already up. But if not, uh, the scribes will make sure that they're going to be up. Uh, and uh, in the past, this used to be covered in lectures. But uh, students found it way too basic. And I actually think that it's way too basic. So. Uh, everybody learns about binary numbers, I believe, in, uh, in uh, high school these days. But if not, uh, please go through the uh, supplementary lecture slides. OK, so these are some reading assignments for next week. Next week, we're going to cover combinational logic chapters from both books. And again, uh, feel free to use either one. And check the course website for all future readings. Re uh, there are going to be required, recommended, and mentioned readings based on the uh, lectures. Again, required ones. Uh, nothing is required, I should say. But required ones are the ones that we believe that you should do to enhance your knowledge for sure. And if you don't do it, if you understand everything perfectly, no problem, I think. Uh, recommended ones are definitely optional. Uh, so you can do it. You can enhance yourself even more. And mentioned ones are just mentioned. And feel free to do it if you have time, for sure. Uh, and I think uh, it's also important that this course will be uh, run similarly to how we ran it in the past. There's not going to be a, any fundamental change. There may be changes here and there. Uh, some, we may cover some concepts that we didn't cover before or take out some concepts. But we're going to be very similar to uh, the schedule that we followed in uh, spring 2020, which is last year. So you can basically anticipate and study future lectures and assignments based on that schedule. And everything is public. You can find the schedule. You can find the YouTube links, et cetera. Uh, and you can find the labs also. And this is a good example of last time prediction. We're going to cover uh, prediction and speculative execution uh, as a basic principle uh, to make uh, to design high performance processors in this lecture. And if you do what I just suggest over here, you would be essentially exercising speculative execution. Speculative execution is the general concept of doing something before knowing that it is needed. Uh, uh, and it's a key concept we will cover in the design of microprocessors to improve performance. You can also improve your performance, right? You can actually watch all of these lectures beforehand, and you, you know what I'm talking about beforehand. I mean, at, after, at that point, you can either decide to watch my lecture uh, this year or not. Uh, but usually, I, I bring in some things for, uh, in, into the lectures uh, that is new. For example, 
we discussed Samsung's FIMDRAM, which was not in the lectures last year. Okay, uh, so uh, basically this is uh, lecture 2A. It took a, bit, a little bit longer than I expected. Uh, any quick questions at this point? Okay, somebody asked, I think I should probably handle, why does this lecture have another name this year and not digital technique? So it's not just this year. Last year, it was also called digital design and computer architecture. So I think digital technique is an okay name also, but uh, the, the lecture evolved uh, to be, uh, I think digital design by itself or digital circuits by itself doesn't do justice to the material that we cover. We don't just talk about digital circuits. We also talk about principles of computer architecture. In fact, uh, we're, we're equally balanced almost between digital design and computer architecture. That's why I, uh, we renamed it, I think, in 2018 uh, to maybe even 2019, uh, uh, one of those, uh, uh, to digital design and computer architecture to be much more accurate in its description. Okay, that's a good question. I like the critical thinking that uh, some of you are doing. <laughs>